Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. I'm Dr. Nicole, and today we're revisiting the topic of anxiety because it's something that has become so prevalent in all of our lives. Most kids and adults are experiencing higher than typical levels of anxiety these days for a lot of reasons. We've talked about anxiety in various ways on the show previously, but today I want to take a bit of a different approach and help normalize the experience of anxiety and the full realm of associated uncomfortable feelings um, that happen in our lives and in our kids' lives, because believe it or not, anxiety is important for us to experience. And what we do with our anxiety and what we teach our kids to do can make the difference between progressing and thriving or getting stuck and feeling helpless. When working with patients, I find it helpful to not only normalize the experience of anxiety, but to look at it as a clue to what we maybe need more or less of to be our healthiest, best selves. And to explore this with us today, I've invited world-renowned neuroscientist, Dr. Wendy Suzuki on the show. She's the award-winning Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences at New York University, where she studies the effects of physical activity and meditation on the brain. She's also a TED speaker and best-selling author of the book, Healthy Brain, Happy Life, that was recently made into a PBS special. Her second book, Good Anxiety, Harnessing the Power of the Most Misunderstood Emotion, was published in September of 2021. The paperback is available now. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This is such a timely topic. We were, you know, chatting before we started recording, and it's like, could there have been a better topic to write about uh, in the last couple of years? Um, so we're going to get into all the things about anxiety and what we can do. But I actually want to start with just a question to help our listeners get to know you a little bit. What yeah. drove you to get into the field of maybe neuroscience more generally or anxiety, the brain movement more specifically? Was there something that sort of led you down that path? Yes, there was a very, very specific event that happened. It happened the very first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley. And I walked into a freshman seminar class and you know, I didn't know the professor, I just chose the title. And the title of the course was The Brain and Its Potential. Little did I know that this class was gonna change my life. I walked into the classroom of a world-renowned neuroscientist, researcher, and incredible instructor. And imagine, if you will, the kind of energy of an academic Beyonce. That's what it kind of felt like in the classroom. It's like, ooh, she's... She, you know, has command of this classroom. I want to hear what she has to say. And she not only pulled out a real preserved human brain from a hat box in a very dramatic portion that made all of fashion that made all of us freshmen go, oh my God, is that a real <laughs> brain? And then she went on to tell us that um, she studies brain plasticity, which is this ability of the human brain to actually change in response to the environment. It could change in a positive way, positive brain plasticity, if you give it good kinds of stimuli, or it could actually change in the negative if you give it bad um, experiences like chronic stress, chronic anxiety. It's not too hard to guess what is positive and negative. And I just thought that was the most fascinating thing I've ever heard in my whole life. I want to be an academic Beyonce just like her. <laughs> and so I went to graduate school and I tried, I tried to do that. And, and I focused on brain plasticity. Memory is a common thing in brain plasticity. So I started with memory, but then I got into the effects of physical activity, mm. which is a wonderfully powerful way to give your entire brain positive brain plasticity. And that led me to my second book, Good Anxiety, because exercise is such a wonderful anxiety reliever. And the book isn't only about exercise, but but seeing how powerful exercise was to relieving both feelings of depression and anxiety kind of got me into that topic. I love it. You, you know, you, you stepped into class on the first day of freshman year and were like, I know what I'm going to do with my, I want to be like her when I grow up. Right. Yep, like what are, exactly. and you know, I've had just, um, faculty members who have shaped me in a similar way. Like it's such a powerful experience. And yeah. you know, what I love about, 
you know, neuroscience is a relatively new field when we mm-hmm. think about that. And even, you know, as you were talking about this idea of um, brain plasticity, even yeah. that is a fairly new phenomenon. Like th- this was not something that we were talking about 40, right. 50 years ago. And yet it's such a powerful um, thing for us as just regular people. You don't have to yeah. be an academician or, you know, a medical professional um, to, to understand this idea of neuroplasticity and, and how empowering yes. that is for us, right? This idea exactly. that our brain can continue to grow and change, I think is so empowering, you know, whatever issues we might be dealing with in our life. It is, it is. And you start to realize that, you know, this isn't like, buy my special pill right. to give you all the brain plasticity. Right. This is, you know what helps brain plasticity? Good sleep. Mm-hmm. You know what happens when you're uh, one of those flight attendants that goes over five um, um, time zones every once in a while? The brain actually responds to that. It actually, there are studies that show that there's a shrinkage Mm -hmm. of the brain because of that sleep deprivation happening all the time, which means just go to sleep. All you have to do to get a big, fat, fluffy brain, as I like to call it, is sleep better, move your body, um, eat things that are good for not only your body, but your brain as well. These things are positive forces of positive brain plasticity. And you know what? You have the power to control all of that. Yeah. So this is like a totally empowering podcast moment here. It's <laughs> up to you. I, I love that. It's really such a big part of my platform is helping parents and helping kids understand that, look, we all have challenges. We all have things that happen to us in life that we'd rather not have happen, right? We all have things that we struggle with, but we also all have the power, as you're talking about, yeah. to take certain actions, to understand these foundations, um, you know, to improve things for ourselves. I, I find that so exciting. Um, and let's talk about it in the realm of anxiety. I want to I want to back up a little bit before we get into the what we can do about it and just yeah. Um, let's frame this up a little bit for people in terms of this idea of anxiety. Okay. I think we all sort of inherently know what that means and what that is, but it seems like it's such a more prevalent issue. Mm -hmm. You know, I look at stats coming out in the research and even in the, you know, popular media all the time now, you know, X percentage increase in the number of people endorsing symptoms of anxiety, yeah. Um, what, why do you feel like anxiety has become sort of such a defining emotion or defining experience for adults and kids right now? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if we just step back for a moment and let's, uh, look at the definition, the simple definition of anxiety, I think that really answers a lot of questions. So the simplest definition that I like to use of anxiety is the feeling of fear or worry associated with an uncertain situation. Now, can you think of uncertain situations that you've, you've lived through recently? Okay. Global pandemic. Anybody have experience with that? No, Um, (laughs) huge uncertainty, but we forget even before the start of the pandemic, um, environmental issues were still a huge issue. The, um, the social media that makes you feel like you're not enough, that there's something out there that that's uncertain that you're never going to have that, that is, it, it contributes to this basic definition of uncertainty. Um, and, and that, that is what we've all experienced, not just in this country, but really all over the world. It is uncertainty that is disquieting and Part of the learning here is to learn how to live better with that feeling of uncertainty. But sometimes just too much uncertainty and everywhere we turn, it's just hard. And that's what we're all dealing with. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I was already seeing that in kids heading into the pandemic, as you said, social media, it it seems like expectations increase for kids constantly. Um, Just so much more pressure and uncertainty. And then the pandemic hit on top of it. And so to me, you know, it doesn't surprise me that the phone rings all day long with parents saying, 
I've got a problem with my kid, like, you know, mm -hmm. and, and some of them, many of them saying, you know, I noticed some things prior, but boy, yeah. the last year or two yeah. has just put this on steroids and, and yeah. we're really having difficulty coping. And to me, that just makes perfect sense, you know, with how you just described it, what anxiety is, this mm -hmm. fear or this unsettledness around uncertainty, around things we can't control. It would kind of be weird if there was a human being not feeling a certain amount of anxiety at this point, right? Yes, exactly. And that also brings up the point that anxiety is a normal human emotion. Don't believe anybody that says, I'm going to cure and get rid of all of your anxiety. That is not possible. Um, it's like saying, I'm going to get rid of all your happiness, right? Yeah. Uh, you would never say that. Well, you, would, you should never say that or believe anybody that says that about anxiety. And it is part of our a kaleidoscope of emotions because as as you mentioned earlier it is there for a reason it is a warning system it evolved to help warn us of danger that is why it's there now of course if we live in huge times of uncertainty it's not surprising where we have higher levels of anxiety but it is helpful to step back for a moment and say okay let me see if i could just use this as a warning it's not the end of the world it is it is a a, a, a louder ringing bell because there is a lot of uncertainty but it's just a bell that's saying hey um, there are perhaps health issues that I need to keep keep track of. There are um, um, there are issues about social interactions that are worrying me, but they them. that's a great solution to that. So it is a warning system. And I think that is a very healthy way to try and approach that both for yourself mm -hmm. and as a, and to model for your children mm -hmm. how you're approaching it can be a huge um lesson great lesson for your whole family and i'm sure you talk to your your patients about that yeah i think you know it's interesting when you say don't trust anybody who says they're going to get rid of your anxiety you know a lot of patients come in and they'll just say you know the parent will say make my kids anxiety go away or or you know the patient will say i just want to be not anxious and i say well that's not what we're going to do in our work together because actually you know the goal is to help keep anxiety in a range that's manageable it's not to make it go away you know one of my professors said a long time ago look if none of us had any anxiety we'd never get anything done exactly Exactly. Do you want to have the energy of laying on the couch watching Netflix for your whole life? Right. Okay. A few days I could That's do right. that. That's right. Based on appealing short term. <laughs> so, you know, I, I'm going to raise something here just because I'm, uh, it's just coming to my mind as we're talking yeah. and I'm genuinely interested in your perspective on this. You know, I read um, last week mm -hmm. that new recommendations have come out medically for screening of children and adults related to anxiety. And, yeah. you know, the recommendation of this task force is that we start in primary care settings, screening all children over the age of eight um, for anxiety. And I'm torn around this because I think it's well-intentioned. I understand the goal and the idea is to make sure that kids and adults aren't suffering unnecessarily, to make sure that people are connected and have support. I get that. Yeah. On the other hand, I have a concern that this really has the possibility of over pathologizing something yeah. that actually is fairly normal. And especially right. when we're talking about a pediatric population, mm -hmm. how kids experience and maybe fill out a checklist, because let's face it, in a primary care setting, this screening is going to be, you know, maybe five to eight checklist questions. Yeah. I just have a concern that it might go the other direction too yeah. and lead practitioners or kids or parents to think that there's a crisis or a pathology or something where there isn't. And so I'm wrestling with this and I'm curious your take on that. I am completely 100% uh, with you on the wrestling. I think it could lead to stigmatization that, oh my God, I now think of myself as a pathologically anxious person. There's something wrong with me. No, you just have maybe a little bit too high volume of a normal human emotion. And for all of that funding that's going to go into that checklist that they all do, what if we just bring more more um, 
uh, activities that will turn the volume down instead of now labeling more people, adults and children or families. Mm -hmm. uh, you're an anxious family now. Um, I, I like to say that there are two um, uh, cost-free uh, um, go-tos that I always use to turn the volume down on my anxiety. And um, number one is I always go there because it's so easy. It is deep breath work. Breath work is the most, the oldest form of meditation ever in, the, in thousands of years, the very first form of meditation. And while those monks thousands of years ago did not know the term parasympathetic nervous system, they were activating the parasympathetic nervous system, which is our natural rest and digest uh, calming part of our nervous system. Did you even know that you had a part of your nervous system that naturally de-stresses you. And the best way to activate that consciously is to deep breathe slowly and deeply. That starts to activate the whole system that calms down your heart rate, slows your respiration, and start to shunt your blood from your muscles towards your digestion and reproductive organs. And it really does. These monks knew, oh, this is a great way to get me into meditation. Well, guess what? It still works today. And it's a great way to calm your nervous system down. And it, it's, um, I like to recommend a box breathing approach because it's so easy. There's four counts and four steps. Step one, inhale on a four count. Step two, hold at the top for four counts. Step three, exhale slowly on four counts and step four, hold at the bottom for mm -hmm. four counts. So easy, try it. You'll you'll start to think, oh, mm -hmm. I, I'm already feeling just naturally more um, more calm. And again, you're using the monk uh, <laughs> technique and you are activating part, I'm telling you the neuroscience of this, you are yeah. activating your parasympathetic yeah. nervous system. I think that understanding why that's helpful is so important because I have patients, yeah. kids and adults who are like, oh yeah, I tried breathing. It didn't work. And it's like, okay, well, what did you actually do? You know, show if you say to a kid or even a lot of adults, okay, show me what a deep breath looks like. And they go, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. like, okay, no, that's not how we need to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the understanding the why, as you just shared, yeah. why that helps the activation of the parasympathetic nervous yeah. system. And, you know, for those of you, who are listening, if you want to delve more into what Wendy's talking about here, just for, for some breathing techniques for your kids, you yeah. can go back and listen to the episode of the show with Campbell Will, where we talk about that. And also Jason Campbell, both of those episodes um, really cover uh, just a lot of the techniques. Um, there's some uh, you know, pieces of those episodes that you can use yourself or with your kids, even as a model to do that. So I, I'm with you. I think that breathing piece is so powerful. And what I love about it is we always have it with us, right? Yeah. We always have it with us, the, the mm -hmm. power, even in any given moment to just drop in right. and focus on our breathing. Um, it's free. It doesn't involve, you know, equipment. We don't have to go right. somewhere special. Yeah. And so what an empowering technique, really. Yeah, yeah. I like to remind um, uh, parents that this is something that you can do in the middle of an anxiety provoking conversation because we all have them. They don't even know you, that anxiety provoking person is talking at you. All you have to do is just take a few breaths, let them talk like they could say whatever they want and just calm yourself down during that. It, it is so powerful. You could practice it with your kids, send it to school with them having a pro problem time, just, just go to some, some quiet place and just do that on your own. That will be an immediate relief to that feeling of anxiety. Love it. So breath work, deep breathing is one. Yeah. What's another tool that you love that we can all access and use to manage yeah. our anxiety? Yeah. So my go-to tool number two is physical activity. So moving your body, what it's doing, let me go into the science so everybody knows why I'm saying this. Moving your body will release a whole bunch of neurochemicals in your brain. You might not even know that, but what is being released? You've heard of these neurochemicals, dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline, endorphins, growth factors are being released. And I like to say that every single time you move your body, it's like giving your brain a wonderful bubble bath 
of neurochemicals. And these, these bubble bath of neurochemicals are making it feel good. This is what, you know, typical antidepressants mm -hmm. are, are doing without any of the withdrawal or any of the other, you know, bad symptoms that you can get with antidepressants. This is a natural antidepressant. And then um, the next uh, question everybody always asks is, how little movement do I really have to do to get the <laughs> bubble bath? And the answer is to get the dopamine, serotonin, noradrenaline bubble bath, 10 minutes of walking. Can you walk for 10 minutes? You don't even have to be in your Lululemon. 10 <laughs> minutes of walking. So powerful. I love that. And, you know, I'm such a proponent of movement for kids and adults. And, yeah. you know, that 10 minute walk, um, something that families can do together. Yes. You know what I say? Everybody after dinner, you know, get out there and just walk mm -hmm. for 10 minutes. You know, yeah. I think this is really interesting too, as I'm hearing you talk about this bubble bath of neurochemicals and movement, you know, I think there are some parents listening who have kids who move a lot, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And who often are told, you know, why, just sit down, just be still, you know, these are kids who get in trouble for moving. And yet I think we need to really reframe that, you know, as you're talking, yeah. I'm thinking, okay, first of all, from an anxiety perspective, if movement is supportive of anxiety reduction, of giving us that good bath of neurochemicals, then we should encourage movement in kids right. when they're feeling stressed or anxious. Absolutely. But Absolutely. also I think our kids who maybe are neurodivergent or just struggle, you know, whether it's with focus and attention or memory or learning or whatever it might be yeah. to be encouraging yeah. movement as opposed to constantly looking at it as movement is a problem to realize that that that's an adaptation they've realized in their yeah. little brains and bodies that that movement actually helps them right absolutely absolutely it does and and um um i think that's such a, such an important message how can we help them i mean there are certain moments where they need to right. sit, sit, sit still yes. but but to show um to treat that as, as a solution mm -hmm. to the problem, it, which it really is. So how can we provide these opportunities to do that? And you provide those opportunities, you're going to come back with a kid that's ready to sit there and ready to learn something and ready to, you know, uh, fill their brain with, with something interesting. Yeah. It strikes me that this, you know, would probably be such a low hanging fruit intervention in our school settings where yeah. educators are, feeling the burden right now of having classrooms filled with kids who are stressed and anxious, overwhelmed, you know, struggling yes. that boy, if we could support even some basic, no cost movement right. interventions, um, what, a, what a great tool that would be. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what I get to do uh, as Dean of the college of arts and science at NYU what can I, what can I recommend to my walking and why we're a walking city here in Manhattan? Yeah. They don't even realize how powerful that is. Can we become as a whole college more intentional about when we use our walking, why we use our walking? Can we prepare for, for our exams with, with group walking or, or class group walking um, uh, slash um, um, breath work uh, uh, slash community and connection, which is also so important. We are a social species as humans, that connection that has become a little bit broken with the pandemic and the isolation that so many students are feeling. And then add on to that, oh, this is my first time away from home ever in my life. I don't know how to socialize or it's, it's, it's challenging in a new way to do that. Um, um, we know all about that. What are those programs that we could help bring some of the psychology, some of this neuroscience to make everybody's brain work better so that we do what we're supposed to do, fill their brains mm -hmm. with all this amazing information um, as their education here um, at any university or any college, middle school, wherever we are. Yeah. You know, I think um, as, as we're talking through these things like breath work, movement and walking, uh, connection, social connection relationships. Yeah. I think, you know, that's one of my concerns around the idea of let's screen everybody to make sure we're diagnosing anyone and everyone with anxiety, because unfortunately, in the way our medical and mental health system works, that tends to be a linear process of, okay, 
you've checked off these symptoms. Now we're giving you a diagnosis. And therefore now the solution comes in a pill bottle uh, and or, you know, go get some therapy. And, and I'm not saying those things aren't sometimes important, but right. what you're talking about really should be the first line recommendations, Absolutely. right? And my concern yeah. is that these generally are not like, as a psychologist, mm -hmm. I'm often the first one to tell a parent for themselves or their kid, okay, anxiety is an issue. Um, here are some things that we can do about that. And I start talking about things like sleep and yeah. movement and food and breath. And yeah. they're going, nobody's ever talked to us about this before. And that's my concern is that how do we start to embed these things so that right. these really are the yeah. first level interventions that right. we're giving to people? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it's, it's uh, too fast to just prescribe the pill. And some parents say, don't tell me about that. Just give me the pill. Right. I need the pill to yeah. cure my, my child. And yeah. I could understand why they might want that it's fast mm -hmm. and it's easy to control. Whereas it's harder to control your sleep. It, it takes, it takes time. It takes effort. It takes wading through both good and bad science that's out there. Mm -hmm. um, but that long-term knowledge that you will gain about yourself and what is your time frame? You know, that's one of, that was one of my projects during the pandemic. Like I'm home all the time. Let me just see how long I really need to sleep. Yes. to to make my brain feel like it works better. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't doing the clinical tests on myself. I was just doing a check-in. How do I feel? And I went from six and a half, seven hours a night, seven on a good night to eight hours. And woo, eight mm -hmm. hours made me feel so much better. And um, this is a simple, okay, I'm, I, I'm, I don't have children in the house. So, so I had more freedom to do yeah. those kinds of experiments, but they are powerful. And even if you have children, do the experiment on your children with your children, mm -hmm. it will change your life. I'm telling you. Absolutely. You know, I see that as such an issue. So many parents and kids are underslept. And, you know, we think about the range for adults, you know, seven, eight hours for us, but kids, depending on their age range, they may need many more than that and, and they're not getting it. And it's, right. you, know, you think that that not sleeping enough combined with not moving their bodies yeah. combined with, you know, an overwhelming world and coming out of a pandemic, you know, it's like, no wonder yeah. kids are so stressed on social media all the time. And so to me, mm -hmm. these are the, these are the foundations um, that I just find so many people are missing, uh, not because they don't want to do them, but because they just haven't been aware yes. that these are things that make a, make a difference. And yeah. you know, Let's touch on the sleep piece. Can you talk from a neuroscience standpoint again about the why? Yeah. Why? Because I think parents go and even kids will go, oh yeah, yeah, sleep is important. Yeah. But why is sleep so important, especially as we think about, you know, anxiety and, and coping? Why is that so, so critical? So the um, kind of uh, dramatic example that I like to give all of my students is that, um, did you realize that if you keep a subject from sleeping too long, mm -hmm. what happens? No, they don't just get cranky. They die. Yeah. Sleep is literally a life affirming. It's part of our survival. So if you think about it that way, you think, ooh, all those times, how many all-nighters did I do when I was in high school because I didn't know any better? That was like... um um taking a little bit off of our, mm -hmm. off of our longevity, because what happens during sleep is something so, so powerful. You are literally recharging your brain to be able to work well. All of those metabolites that have built up, think of it as a garbage pail of buildup in your neurons, they get flushed out. So sleeping three or four hours a night, Think of more and more garbage building up in your brain night after night, day after day. And are you fresh? Are you are you able to get on top of things? Well, maybe with an espresso shot, but that is just masking the problem that you are getting duller and duller because you, you have not allowed your brain to really refresh in this biologically relevant 
way. Um, one of my best examples is, uh, my favorite examples comes from Matthew Walker, an expert on, on sleep from UC Berkeley, who did, an ex uh, who did the all-nighter experiment. Mm -hmm. So he compared the brain performance and behavioral performance of a group of students who were determined to have slept for eight hours. We're sure you didn't cheat. You didn't say, oh yeah, I slept for eight hours. We, they, he, he monitored them sleeping for eight hours. And then he monitored the other group um, staying up all night. The difference of that for just a single night was between the next day, learning for the group that slept for eight hours would, was on the A level. They were able to learn and retain information so that at the test, they got an A. The students that didn't sleep for just one night, they learned 40% less that earned them an F. Mm -hmm. So they went from an A to an F after a single night of mm -hmm. uh, a single all-nighter. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know, I think that always just motivates students who yeah. are trying to get the A with right. their staying up. They don't realize that they are working against themselves. And it's a great example to use, I think, with older kids, even like, yeah. look, you yeah. know, you you want to do well in school, you want to do well in sports, mm -hmm. you want to do well in your life. Sleep is, you know, an, an important piece of that. And I think you know, I am seeing more and more kids coming into the clinic mm -hmm. who are getting less and less sleep. A big part of it is devices. Mm -hmm. You know, is parents yeah. just not realizing that, yeah, you actually need to have the devices out of their bedroom at night. They're yes. kids. They're not yes. going to regulate that. Well, look, most right. adults don't regulate that well, right? It's like you can't have them in there if you, if you want them to be getting enough sleep. I mean, I have a lot of preteens and teens mm -hmm. who will admit, you know, I get maybe three or four hours a night because, oh you know, I wake up to go to the bathroom, then I come back out. Oh, now I'm checking my notification. It's like the devices need to not be there. I, I yeah. have seen that as a major driving factor in why even well-intentioned kids yeah. are getting less and less sleep today. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's not surprising. I mean, um, there's a double whammy there because it's not just um, they're they're looking at their notifications, but the mere act of looking at a screen is activating a part of your visual system that naturally keeps you more awake. So mm -hmm. by doing that, it, you're you're disrupting your sleep even more beyond just the oh I'm taking more time to look at my screen. You are literally activating your your brain to be like noon time mm -hmm. when it's maybe three a.m. Mm -hmm. And so people don't realize that and. Not to say there's not a time to check your notifications, but do it in the morning. Right. Do it. Don't do it at night, go, getting ready for sleep, or absolutely not in the middle of the night. You are going to just activate your brain. It's going to be even harder to get back to sleep. Yeah. And I think that becomes this cycle that's difficult to break then, especially for adults and kids who are like, oh, I have anxiety about sleeping. Right. Okay. So I'm just going to scroll this. Now, and look at this. Okay, now I've doubled down on that. Now I really can't sleep. And now I'm like, right. oh, but I can't fall asleep. I need, you know, and they just get into this cycle. And it's like, you got to look for ways to to break that because yeah, as you just shared, it's, it's such a problem. Yeah. Um, I I want to, as, as we're wrapping up here, I want to bring back this idea of neuroplasticity. Yeah. Because I meet kids and adults most of the time, this messaging comes from adults to children or adults tell themselves this. Well, I'm just an anxious person. <laughs> this is just who I am. This runs in my family. You know, I'm just anxious or I'm neurotic or my kids just, you know, yeah. oversensitive, over anxious. It's just how it is. Yeah. Yeah. I want to circle back to what we started with around this idea of neuroplasticity and would love yeah. to have you just comment on that from the standpoint of the brain's ability to change. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say for those people who label themselves as I come from an anxious line of family, um, I would say this is a great moment to bring in the idea of mindset mm -hmm. and how your own belief system can be so powerful for your brain. And it could be powerful in a positive way. And it could also be powerful in a negative way. If you label yourself as anxious, there's no way I can get out of this. This is just how the world is. Then that is how your world is going to be. Mm -hmm. However, if you, you, you open your mind to um, a different way of thought, a different way of believing, um, and opened your mind to the concept of brain plasticity that we know is a true kind of scientific 
phenomenon. You know that the brain is capable of lots and lots of amazing learning. It's it's basically un, uh, uncumbered. You can learn whatever you choose to learn. And what if you choose to learn the fact that you are not anxious? You are going to quell, and you're not going to get rid of it. Everybody's going to be a little bit anxious because it's part of our our thing, uh, our no normal human emotions. But you are going to become the first in your family to be uh, to to master your anxiety. Maybe you'll even be able to use that anxiety. Maybe anxiety isn't the thing that pulls you down. Maybe you use the protective elements of your anxiety to create what I call in my book, superpowers mm -hmm. of anxiety. There is a mindset shift that I would like to share with the rest of the world. Um, and and that that is such a powerful thing. It's again, based on normal human learning, which is based on brain plasticity. That's what learning is, is our ability to change and shift to something new. And um, you might say, well, what, what kind of superpower can come from my from my um, anxiety. Let me just share with you my very favorite, there's six superpowers that I talk about in the book, uh, but my very favorite is the superpower of empathy mm -hmm. that comes from our own anxiety. And this is something I discovered on my own, exploring my own anxieties, which I did as I was writing this book. And I realized that growing up, my oldest form of anxiety is, um, is that form of social anxiety. It was a very shy young kid, lots of children are shy. Mm -hmm. I was very, very shy, but I was always interested in school. And I always had the struggle. I was really interested in school, but I didn't like to put my hand up and ask questions because of course I was fearful of being told that I was stupid. I asked the wrong question, embarrassing myself. So I had the struggle for years and years and years and years, but I went into academia and I found myself at the front of the classroom one day because mm -hmm. I was in academia. And I suddenly realized that I had this superpower because I knew that I had my students that were raising their hands, but I knew that there were three or four times more students that had questions that were too scared to raise their hands because that's that's who I was. And so I ended up coming early, staying late, and making sure I would answer all of those questions. That is, I had I had discovered my own empathy superpower that will be different from you because you're uh, anxiety, uh, a form of anxiety that's most common will be different from mine, but you will be able to know what it feels like, know what it looks like, and then turn it to the outside and simply help somebody else that you see in that same situation. It is so, you know what happens when you, when you, um, when you express empathy in the form of compassion, you get a hit of dopamine. So I like to say, come for the empathy, stay for the dopamine. And that becomes your superpower of anxiety. Oh, I love it. So great. And, you know, we, we currently, you know, the, the, the stats for kids with anxiety in particular tell us that with the standard treatment, which includes, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals and cognitive behavior therapy, fewer than 50% of kids get to the point where they have symptom reduction. Really? And then of that 50%, way fewer two years later are still experiencing symptom reduction. So, you know, wow. that's a depressing statistic. But what it says to me on the flip side is what an opportunity we have mm -hmm. to help reframe this, to help kids, parents, adults understand yeah. how to approach this yeah. in a different way, how to leverage all the important lifestyle things you're talking about. Yeah. Because yeah. whether you find therapy or medication beneficial or not, you still need these foundations. And I think this is what's missing in the conversation. And you've yeah. done such a beautiful idea uh, way of, of laying that out today. And I just really appreciate you shining a spotlight on this because this is clearly so needed. Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. And still trying on my end to, to find, as you're saying, you know, creative ways to get this message out because it's one thing to to talk about it on a podcast and it's another to really get 
the people that we want to, to really adopt it, to know what to do. What is that step one? Where do I start exactly? It seems mm -hmm. so, you know, yeah. overwhelming mm -hmm. sometimes, yeah. but that is what I think all of us as a community are working towards. Absolutely. So, and yeah. to that end, I want to make sure that people know where they can find your book. I know it came out last year, but the paperback yes. is available now. Yeah, so tell us where it. we can get that. And also if people want to learn more about you and your work, where should they yeah. go? Yeah, they should go to wendysuzuki.com. You could hear all, you can learn all about my research, see all my TED Talks and videos and podcasts are there. You could also go to goodanxiety.com where you can get links uh, to both the hardback and the paperback. And um, it's also available at all major uh, outlets, the book, Good Anxiety. Awesome. Love it. Wendy, if, a, if somebody's listening and says, what's one thing I should start, one thing I can do right now, to support my anxiety, what's one thing you would have them do? I would have them take an intentional 10 minute walk today and ask yourself, how do I feel? Is Has this helped me this 10 minute walk that I know is creating a bubble bath of neurochemicals in my brain? That awareness is the first step to getting to good anxiety. I love it. Dr. Wendy Suzuki, thank you so much for being here and sharing your work with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. This was so much fun. And thanks as always to all of you for being here and for listening. We'll catch you back here next time.